morning and welcome to St George's and St Mary Magdalene Barbour. My name is the Reverend Sue Pollard and I'm one of the ministry team here responsible for you lovely people. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning to celebrate Holy Communion. Just one or two small notices before we uh, begin. Um, a reminder that next Sunday there is a Zoom service at 10.30 and you'll probably get the link on the newsletter or oh, it's already on our family in Pitasius. And there will be an in-person service at 4.30 of Holy Communion that will be at Claims Church. 4.30 at Claims. Well, I do thank you very much for continuing to keep the Covid uh, safe regulations while we're in church. Do please remain seated throughout, and you probably got used to the fact that there's no collection, and um, well, I will bring the bread round to you, but please remain seated, and then the church wardens will uh, negotiate with you when it's time to move, and um, hopefully if the rain stops, we may be able to gather and sing together outside, but only if the rain stops. Just a moment of quiet before we begin. going to hear our first hymn, which is number 310. Des will play it beautifully for us, and if you'd like to follow in the hymn book, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Mm.
our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer, and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God our Father, we come now to you in sorrow for our shortcomings, our mistakes, both deliberate and not deliberate, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. The Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you pardon and forgiveness for all your sins. Time for amendment of life and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For the Gloria, we will say the first two lines, Gloria, Gloria, in excelsis Deo, and we'll say it twice. Gloria, Gloria, in excelsis, in excelsis. Gloria, Gloria, in excelsis Deo. We now pray the collect for the Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. Difficult God, whom the world judges mad or worse, reveal our life's distortions causing us normality. Enlarge our sense of family beyond those close to us and cast down Satan's kingdom of cruelty and exclusion through Jesus Christ, the one who is accused. Amen. Amen. Can we now hear the first of our readings? The first reading is from St Paul's letter to the Corinthians. The first reading is from St Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe, I therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building. 
oozing from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. But in this tent we grow, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading. Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to the end. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He's gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He had Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. And they, he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <coughs> well, I absolutely love Paul's imagery in that letter to the Corinthians. He's encouraging them not to lose heart, and they've had some really hard times. Many of them were being persecuted, and Paul wants to offer them hope and encourage them not to lose heart. And then he compares their bodies to tents. Now, only Paul, a tent maker, could compare their bodies to tents. He says their earthly bodies might be wasting away, but their heavenly bodies are being renewed daily. And I was thinking, it's not a bad analogy, especially as we get older. Just like musty old scout tents, our bodies get steadily more decrepit. Who hasn't got a few men's tent pegs? <laughs> Who hasn't got a zip with a few missing teeth? Let's not go anywhere near the leaks. We won't talk about those. Even though our bodies age and succumb to illness, Paul reassures us that nothing can get in the way of God's presence in our lives when we fix our eyes on him. And one day, he says, we won't need our tents anyway. For our eternal bodies and our eternal homes await. Over the years, I've visited many people with dementia, and it is always heartwarming to see how many people who maybe even cannot remember their own name can recite the Lord's Prayer quite spontaneously. I remember visiting one lady, a lovely lady, who had dementia. A really faithful Christian. And when I said, let's say the Lord's Prayer together, I was really saddened that she didn't join. 
And then I saw that she was holding her hands out to receive the Holy Spirit. And I remembered that she was a charismatic. So she may not have remembered the words, but she knew how to hold her body and to expect the Holy Spirit. And this gives me hope that whatever our circumstances, nothing can get in the way of us knowing the loving presence of our God. Whether we have physical ailments, financial worries, whether we're finding it hard to rejoin society after lockdown, or whether we have mental ill health, God through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit is right there alongside us, calling us on when we fix our eyes on him. In the Gospel reading, the people surrounding Jesus are trying to understand who he is. This passage comes right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And it's been a bit of a whirlwind. He's been baptised, he's been in the desert, he's confronted the, the devil, he's um, called his disciples, he's getting them to follow him, and he's been healing and performing miracles and uh, casting out demons, preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. And not surprisingly, word about Jesus has spread. Who is this man who casts out demons? No one can dismiss them as untrue. People are seeing these miracles for themselves. So what's the explanation? Mark likes to wrap one story within another, a bit like a sandwich. So in the middle of the story about Jesus visiting home, we have this encounter with the scribes. And Mark uses this method to, uh, for one story to bring light onto the other story. There are three groups in the story, three different groups. There are the scribes, there are Jesus' family, and there are the crowd. Well, let's look at the scribes first. These are not just local scribes. These are scribes from Jerusalem. They're so perturbed in Jerusalem, they're labelling him as the devil. The scribes believe themselves to be God representatives. And if Jesus Jesus wasn't on their side preaching their word, then he must surely be in league with the opposition, i.e. Satan. But Jesus turns their accusations back on him, back on them. If he is Satan, why would he be casting out demons? He turns the tables against the scribes, accusing the Holy Spirit as the work of the devil. They're committing an unforgivable sin. In saying that Jesus, in saying this, Jesus is himself living dangerously. He's upsetting the status quo. And that reminds us that sometimes we are called to do the same. The second group are Jesus' family. They really don't know what to think about him. His unconventional behaviour. Is creating a scene. And whether they're embarrassed, or whether they're angry, or whether they think he's deluded, they're certainly not sure that he's in the right frame, right state of mind. And the text tells us that the family try to seize him. They want to shut him up. I wonder if they're trying to protect him, or if they're trying to protect themselves. Could certainly be concerned for their reputation. Now, if you have a family where everyone in your family shares your Christian beliefs, I'd say you're very blessed, but I imagine you're also quite unusual. Faith still creates tensions within families today, whether it's between partners or between parents and children, or brothers and sisters. Many of you will have experienced situations where just coming to church has called uncertainty, has called puzzlement, maybe even derision from those you love. And there may be other tensions. Maybe one person in your family is encouraging you to do something, not illegal, but it might be very 
totally on dishonest or unethical or immoral, maybe just a white lie, just a little fib. I remember when my children were teenagers insisting on telling the truth when they were off school for any reason. And if I had to phone from school, I would not, I'm not going to say you've got a cold. If she hasn't got a cold, I'm going to say you went to bed late and you're tired. <laughs> Much to their disgust. I'm sure you can think of examples where you've done your best and remain honest and truthful, much to the disappointment of those in your family. The pressures we experience from our families alone call into question our priorities. But Jesus is clear. Our allegiance is to him. The final group in this story are named as the crowd, the followers, the intrigued, the disciples, the curious. These are the people who are starting to recognise something in Jesus that is divine. And they're sitting around Jesus in a circle, in a ring. These people are like us, gathered around Jesus like we are this morning, listening to his word, trying to glean his vision for our lives, for our church, for our families, eager for that promise of hope, that encouragement not to lose heart. The sense of belonging we feel here in church, that sense of common identity, of shared values and ideals, is so precious. Having missed it during lockdown, it is even more treasured. Here we are, God's beloved, chosen, no ifs, no buts, but all of us beloved. And certainly at St George's and Thames, when we say that everybody is included, that's what we mean. Whatever anyone's gender, sexuality, colour, disability, everyone is in this circle. In the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to be the person God calls us to be. To know life in all its fullness. It's the call to be kingdom people, to sit around Jesus, to participate in communion, to listen to him even when other people say we are crazy, that we are deluded, and sometimes we are called to challenge the status quo and pay the price. Those who do his will have the privilege of being called his brothers and sisters and mothers. We are called to be kingdom people, to bring about love, justice, compassion and freedom. We are his family. It's amazing. We've all been through some hard times recently. His message to us, do not lose heart, stay strong, because nothing can get in the way of God's presence in our lives when we fix our eyes on him. And through the redemption of his son, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we can look forward to those heavenly bodies and that heavenly home. We continue our service on page five as we say the creed together. 
Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from our hand. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As Jesus called us his family, so he has granted us the privilege to speak with him as a brother. The response for the prayers this morning, when I say, we will wait for the Lord, will you respond, our hope is in your word. We will wait for the Lord. Our hope is in your word. Lord Jesus, crowds flocked to see you. As we, your crowd here in this church, kneel or sit before your presence, draw us closer together as we become your body, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit here on earth. We pray for our community, each and every one of us. And we thank you for each and every one of us and for all that everyone has shared and given and prayed. We ask that you will continue to guide us as we decide what is our best worship pattern for the months to come. We thank you for what we've been able to manage so far. And we ask that always you will give us thankful hearts with which to praise you. We will wait for the Lord. Our hope is in your word. Lord Jesus, some questioned your sanity and motives. Stand alongside our leaders and elected representatives as they grapple with the pace of change and shifting social landscapes brought about by COVID-19. We pray for all those involved in the G7 summit, each one bringing a responsibility of decision-making not only for their own country, but for the countries of the world. We pray that you will help them to make good decisions for the good of all and that these decisions will be put into practice and attempted to be made real. Hold before us and them a vision of your kingdom of justice and compassion to guide us through the mist of uncertainty. We will wait for the Lord. Our hope is in your word. Lord Jesus, you said that a closed heart shuts out your forgiveness. Confront our stubbornness over those things which you know us to be stubborn about. And grant us to see with open minds and hearts your grace and your truth. We ask that in humility and peace, in this time of uncertainty and changing decision making, we remember that the constancy of your presence with us. We will wait for the Lord. Our hope is in your word. Lord Jesus, you call servants of your will, not just friends, but members of your family. Look in compassion on your brothers and sisters in their need. We remember all those on the prayer list. And we ask especially 
in a time of quiet for those known to us who are in need of any kind at the moment. We place our trust in your constant mercy. We will wait for the Lord. Our hope is in your word. Lord Jesus, you prepare for your family an eternal round of glory. Bring into your eternal presence all who have died and all who grieve the loss of a loved one. We pray especially this week for John Thomas and family, for Colin Brady and family, for Kathleen Smith and family, for Edna Alderson and her family, and for all those known to us, current or past, who you know we grieve for in our hearts. Raise us with them to live with you forever. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Trinity is uproar and colour, dissent and challenge, wandering and exile, invitation and inclusion, drawing our bodies and spirits into the righteous harmony of God. The peace of the God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and with you always. And also, and also with, with you. you. And just a brief wave of people of peace. There will be no physical collection today as usual. Um, what are you going to do? Where or anything in your head? Just time for another head, sorry. Um, 303 is the hymn we're going to sing in the Blue Hymn Book. Here is bread, here is wine.
that we bring, we shall remember Jesus. With this wine that we bring, we shall remember Jesus. Bread for his body, wine for his blood, gifts from God to his table we bring. We shall remember Jesus. And no less than these gifts of bread and wine, are our offerings of what we have to offer for those in need and for the work and ministry of this church. So we ask for God's blessing as these gifts go out to those in need, that they may too know the blessing of God's constant presence with them. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Blessed are you, Lord God, our light and our salvation. To you be glory and praise forever. From the beginning you have created all things. And all your works echo the silent music of your praise. In the fullness of time you made us in your image, the crown of all creation. You give us breath and speech, that with angels and archangels and all the powers of heaven, we may find a voice to say your praise. Together we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. How wonderful the work of your hands, O Lord. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own. When they turned away and rebelled, your love remained steadfast. From them you raised up Jesus our Saviour, born of Mary, to be the living bread, in whom all our hungers are satisfied. He offered his life for sinners, and with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms on the cross. On the night before he died, he came to supper with his friends, and taking bread, he gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Saviour of the world. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation, that they may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ, and build us into a living temple to your glory. Bring us at last with St. George, St. Mary Magdalene, and all the saints, to the vision of that eternal splendour for which you have created.